Good afternoon and welcome to our daily devotions where we are looking at the women of the Bible. This week we are focusing on Herodias. This is part one of four where we take a look at her story. Her character. A proud woman, she used her daughter to manipulate her husband into doing her will. She acted arrogantly from beginning to end in complete disregard for the laws of the land. Her shame, to be rebuked by an upstart prophet for leaving her husband Philip in order to marry his half-brother, Herod Antipas. Her triumph, that her scheme to murder her enemy, John the Baptist, worked. Key scriptures, Matthew 14 verses 3 to 12, Mark 6 verses 14 to 29, Luke 3 verses 19 to 20 and chapter 9 verses 7 to 9. Her story. Her grandfather, Herod the Great, had ruled Judea for 34 years. Herod had brought prosperity to a troubled region of the Roman Empire, building theatres, amphitheatres and race courses, as well as a palace and a magnificent temple in Jerusalem. In addition to such ambitious endeavours, he had even contrived to lower taxes on two occasions. But Herod's reign contained shadows at that darkened as the years went on. Herodias knew the stories well, how her grandfather had slaughtered a parcel of Jewish brats in Bethlehem, how he had murdered his favourite wife, her own grandmother, and three of his sons for a real or imagined intrigue. Advancing age and illness did nothing to improve his character. Herod was determined, in fact, that his own death would produce a time of universal mourning rather than celebration. So in a final act, he commanded all the leading Jews to gather in Jericho. Then he imprisoned them in a stadium and ordered them to be executed at the moment of his death. But the king was cheated of his last wish. His prisoners were set free as soon as he died in the spring of 4 BC. But not a nice man, her grandfather, Herodias' husband and his half-brother Antipas had been lucky survivors of Herod, the great's bloody family. But Antipas had proved the luckier of the two. For while Philip and Herodias languished in Rome, with no territory to rule, Antipas was appointed treacherous of Galilee and Perea. She could sense the man's power the first time he visited them in Rome, and power, she mused, was her favourite aphrodisiac. Though Herod Antipas was married to the daughter of King Aratas IV, ruler of Nabatea in the east, he quickly divorced her in favour of Herodias. In one dicey move, Antipas had stolen his brother's wife, compromised his eastern border and alienated his Jewish subjects, whose law forbade wife-swapping, especially among brothers. But with Herodias beside him, Herod Antipas must have thought himself powerful enough to manage the consequences. But neither Herod Antipas nor Herodias had expected their transgression to become a matter of public agitation. After all, who was there to agitate except the usual ragtag band of upstarts? A real prophet had not troubled Israel for more than 400 years, but trouble was edging toward them in the form of the new Elijah, whom God had been nurturing with locusts and honey in the wilderness that bordered their realm. This prophet, John the Baptist, cared nothing for diplomacy. He could not be bought or bullied and was preaching a message of repentance to all who would listen. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John the Baptist spared no one, not the ordinary people who flocked to him in the desert, nor the self-righteous Pharisees or the privileged Sadducees, 
and certainly not Herod Antipas or Herodias, whom he chided for their unlawful marriage. Herodias wanted Antipas to kill John, yet even he had to step carefully, lest he ignite an uprising among John's ever-growing number of followers. That would be all the excuse his former father-in-law, Aratus, would need in order to attack Antipas's eastern flank. So according to the Jewish historian Josephus, Antipas imprisoned John in Maserus, a fortress just east of the Dead Sea. On Herod Antipas's birthday, a feast was held in his honour and attended by a who's who list of dignitaries. During the evening, Herodias's daughter, Salome, performed a dance for Herod Antipas and his guests, which so pleased him that he promised his stepdaughter anything she desired up to half his kingdom. Ever the good daughter, Salome hastened to her mother for advice. Should she request a splendid palace or a portion of the royal treasury? But Herodias had one thing only in mind. When Salome returned to the banquet hall, Salome surprised Antipas with a gruesome demand. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Though Herod Antipas was distressed by her request, he was even more distressed at the prospect of breaking an oath he had so publicly made. Therefore, in complete disregard for Jewish law, which prohibited both execution without trial and decapitation as a form of execution, he immediately ordered John's death. That night, Herodias must have savoured her triumph over the man whom Jesus referred to as the greatest of those who had yet lived. John had been sent at, as the last of the prophets, a new Elijah, whose preaching was to prepare the way for Jesus. Had Herodias heeded John's call to repentance, her heart might have welcomed the gospel. Rather than being remembered as just one more member of the bloody dynasty, she could have become a true child of God. Instead of casting her lot with the great woman of the Bible. However, she chose to model herself on one of the worst, Jezebel, her spiritual mother. By so doing, she sealed her heart against the truth and all the transforming possibilities of grace. Thank you for joining me. Quite an interesting account there of Herodias and her ways and the way in which she allowed her anger and her resentment in her soul to to take over her and the example of which had she allowed the repentant spirit and the repentance message from John the Baptist to take heed to that message had she allowed that to happen she would have transformed her soul by the grace of God so this week we will look at ways in which we can really deal with those emotions, deal with those feelings in a different way to which Herodias did. Join me tomorrow as we take a look at her life and times with a specific focus on the Herod family. Stay safe, keep praying and God bless. This is part two of four, where we take a look at her life and times with a specific focus on the Herods. Both husbands of Herodias were part of the Herodian family of rulers, as was Herodias herself. Her first husband, Herod Philip, as well as her second husband, Herod Antipas, were her uncles. The family of the Herods ruled in Judea and the surrounding areas for over 125 years. The first Herod, known as Herod the Great, was king of Judea from 37 to 4 BC. His reign was marked by division and domestic troubles, but also by prosperity. While in power, he brought amphitheatres, palaces, fortresses, Gentile temples and the temple of Herod in Jerusalem. This temple was his crowning achievement, 
noted by the historian Josephus as Herod's most noble work. The literature of the rabbis of this time states, He who has not seen the temple of Herod has never seen a beautiful building. Herod the Great's five wives produced seven sons, most of whom went on to rule parts of the Near East for the Roman Empire. Philip, Herod's son by Mariam of, si of Simon, was Herodias's first husband. Herodias herself was the daughter of another of the Herod's sons. That made her Herod's granddaughter, as well as his daughter-in-law by marriage. Herodias wasn't the only one of Herod's children to form such relationships. Herod's grand great-granddaughter, Bernice, became the consort of her brother, Herod Agrippa II, also a great-grandchild of Herod. The events at the birthday banquet described in Mark 6 are the culmination of years of corrupt living by a family who had power and knew how to use and misuse it. Herodias's actions, though horrifying, are not really surprising. Each step along the way to requesting John the Baptist's death was perhaps a small one, Little noticed, but each step made its relentless way down a path to sin until what would have been unconscionable years before now seemed acceptable and reasonable. Sin is like that. As your mother told you, and it's true, one small lie leads to another bigger lie that leads to another even bigger lie. The path of sin is strewn with small, seemingly insignificant decisions that lead nowhere but farther along the path away from truth and God. We will now listen to Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 29. The death of John the Baptist. Herod Antipas the king soon heard about Jesus because everyone was talking about him. Some were saying, This must be John the Baptist raised from the dead. That is why he can do such miracles. Others said, He's the prophet Elijah. Still others said, He's a prophet like the other great prophets of the past. When Herod heard about Jesus, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has come back from the dead. For Herod had sent soldiers to arrest and imprison John as a favor to Herodias. She had been his brother Philip's wife, but Herod had married her. John had been telling Herod, It is against God's law for you to marry your brother's wife. So Herodias bore a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But without Herod's approval, she was powerless. For Herod respected John, and knowing that he was a good and holy man, he protected him. Herod was greatly disturbed whenever he talked with John, but even so he liked to listen to him. Herodias's chance finally came on Herod's birthday. He gave a party for his high government officials, army officers, and the leading citizens of Galilee. Then his daughter, also named Herodias, came in and performed a dance that greatly pleased Herod and his guests. Ask me for anything you like, the king said to the girl, and I will give it to you. He even vowed, I will give you whatever you ask, up to half my kingdom. She went out and asked her mother. What should I ask for? Her mother told her. Ask for the head of John the Baptist. So the girl hurried back to the king and told him. I want the head of John the Baptist right now on a tray. Then the king deeply regretted what he had said. But because of the vows he had made in front of his guests, he couldn't refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner to the prison to cut off John's head and bring it to him. The soldier beheaded John in the prison, brought his head on a tray, and gave it to the girl, who took it to her mother. When John's disciples heard what had happened, they came to get his body and buried it in a tomb. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We would now reflect on the following two questions. Number one, note the different responses to John in verses 19 to 20. What do these responses tell you about Herod and Herodias? Number two, how do you typically respond when confronted with a sin or failing? Do you get angry, sulk, listen to what the other person says but without changing your behavior, cry or feel hurt, 
Do whatever you can to please the other person. Face whatever is true in the other person's rebuke. Thank you for joining me. As we hear about the Herod family, at the end we can see that every little step and all it took was very little discrepancies, very little points of sin that grew and grew to the ultimate killing of John the Baptist. And as it says, you know, how one small lie leads to a little bigger one, a little bigger one, a little bigger one. When we don't deal with these things in our lives, they can grow into things that become uncontrollable, things that become too big, too big a cross to, to even bear. Or look at, look at how she ended up in this predicament by allowing that sin, that anger, that frustration in her, she took it to that level, to the level of actually killing somebody. So what sin do we have in our lives and how do we deal with it? How do we deal with it? How do we deal with it? John the Baptist speaks of that repentance that we have to bring it to confess our sins, which is why on a Sunday, we have a time of confession where we think about the things we may have said or done that have been displeasing to the Lord. And we confess those to the Lord, allowing the Lord to deal with that sin within us. Allowing the Lord, by his grace and his mercy, he forgives us by his grace and his mercy. He died on the cross for us so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we don't have to walk with this burden on us. Herodias never allowed that herself to be freed from that burden and it grew in her. It grew and it grew. So may we confess our sins to the Lord, lay at the foot of the cross and allow him to mercifully forgive us and carry that burden for us. Join me tomorrow as we take a look at her promises. Stay safe, keep praying and God bless. This is part three of four where we take a look at her promise. As negative as it sounds, the lesson or promise learned from Herodias can only be that sin will devour us. If sin always has its way in our lives, it will eventually consume us. There is only one way out. If we abandon our sin and repent, we will find forgiveness and a new life in Christ. He promises to forgive even the most horrific sins, the most depraved lifestyles, the most abandoned behaviours. We may still face the consequences of our sin, but we will no longer have a fear, have to fear its judgment. With Christ as our mediator, we become as clear as if we had never sinned. Some promises in scripture. Psalm 32 verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Psalm 103 verses 10 to 12. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Isaiah 1 verse 18. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. We will now reflect on the following questions. Number one, what are the signs in this story that power, control, getting her way, 
was important to Herodias. 2. When has getting your way seemed highly important to you? What did you do to get your way? What were the consequences? Number 3. What do you imagine it was like to be the daughter of Herodias? Thank you for listening. How pleasing to know the promises in scripture. The promises that once we go to Christ and repent, he has forgiven us and can carry those burdens for us. Having to live with that fear of judgment is a a heavy cross to bear. So we can always go to the Lord. And no matter how big a sin we may have committed, we can go to the Lord from the very small things to the things that you think are unforgivable. We can take those to Christ and repent. And he can carry that burden for us. That fear of judgment can be lifted and ultimately that's what has us bound. So may you go to the Lord as we reflect on Herodias. Let us go to the Lord. Confess it all. Just lay it all down for him. And know that our sins have been forgiven. That Jesus loves us regardless of what we may have done, said, or thought. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. Join me tomorrow as we take a look at her legacy of prayer. Stay safe, keep praying, and God bless. This part four of four, where we take a look at her legacy of prayer. Mark six eighteen to 19 For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. We can reflect on Mark chapter 6 verses 14 to 29. We can praise God that he gives us opportunities to repent and turn back to him. We can offer thanks for the men and women in your own life who have had the courage to tell you the truth. We can confess any tendency to respond defensively to constructive criticism. We can ask God for the grace to respond to correction with humility. A way in which we can lift our hearts. Most of us hate criticism. Part of our defensiveness stems from our inability to see the connection between brokenness and grace. How differently we would respond if we understood that repentance is like a garden hoe breaking up the soil to make it ready for the seed. If we want to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control, we must cherish the truth however it comes to us. Being receptive to criticism doesn't mean we become people with low self-esteem. It simply means that we will be open about our sins and faults, believing in God's desire to forgive us and help us to change. This week, take some time for a little soul searching. Is God trying to get your attention about something that is off kilter in your own life? Is he raising up a prophet in your own family? a child or husband who is trying to tell you the truth. If so, listen, and then pray about what you hear. Resist the temptation to make the person pay for his or her words by sulking, holding a grudge, or criticising him or her in turn. Instead, be the first to say you're sorry. A habit of repentance will make your heart fertile soil. For God's grace. Let us pray. Father, I know how deceitful the human heart can be. 
Please give me the courage to be honest and the faith to believe in your forgiveness. May my heart become a place of brokenness where grace and truth can flourish. Amen. Thank you for joining me this week as we reflected on Herodias. She's definitely an example for us to know that how the importance, sorry, of repenting our sins and giving them up to Christ, confessing them to Christ, that he can give us a new life, a new way as he's forgiven our sins. It's very it's very hard sometimes to hear the truth from people, to hear constructive criticism that will help us. Sometimes it's hard to hear, sometimes we take it defensively. But may we be reminded by Herodias that there is help. There is help, there is another way. So as we receive that criticism, keep those people in your lives, those people that don't tell you what you want to hear, but tell you the truth in love. Constructive criticism. And be mindful of how you receive that criticism. People do these things in love and is there to help you. So may you as you reflect on Herodias, take those things to the Lord. Don't store them up. As we see what happens when it's stored up, it tends to grow and the enemy will use it against you. Release yourself. Release yourself, repent and give it to the Lord. The Lord will show you a new way and give you a new life and release you of that burden. Have a great weekend. Join me next week as we take a look at another great woman of the Bible. Herodias wasn't so great, but we can learn from her. <laughs> Stay safe, keep praying, and God bless. Smiler Spice presents the three in one challenge. Challenge 1. Devotion. Complete a guided daily devotional for 40 days praying about a particular dream, desire or concern you may have in your life. Challenge 2. Prayer. We come together in unity praying in one accord daily 7pm for 2 minutes. Set your alert. Challenge 3. Fast. Each Wednesday we will fast giving up one thing so that we can spend more focused time in prayer that could be food tv social media whatever you choose think you're up for the challenge click the link to download the resource and join us as we start on february the 18th